Good morning, everyone. Welcome to La Cunada Congregational Church. This morning, we are starting a new series of sermons built around the book of wisdom known as Ecclesiastes. And this is a book of wisdom that is filled with a lot of dread and discomfort. But I hope that as we read through it, you would also find the ways that it does bring us hope in the midst of our own dread and discomfort. But to begin, we start with the psalm. In fact, Psalm 1 that establishes really how the rest of the Psalms are built. It's a call that allows us to find our delight and our worship in the Lord. And so I hope that you are able to worship with us this morning. The psalmist writes, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. I hope that you find that your worship this morning fills you as a tree planted by a stream, that the waters of God would flow and give you grace this morning as we worship. Oh 
invite you now to pray with me this prayer of confession. O oh God, we know our happiness rests in you. Lead us beside still waters, rooted in truth and love. Protect our feet from the path of selfishness, and by your forgiveness, show us the better way. In the name of Jesus, amen. We receive so much from God, forgiveness, grace, mercy, and we have an opportunity to bestow those gifts to others, even through our prayer. And so I invite you to name those that you know that are in need, that they might find God's grace, God's assurance, God's forgiveness. And if you find yourself in need as well, lift those prayers up to God, knowing that God in love and mercy hears you. And once more, united with other saints around our community, I invite you to pray with me the prayer that the Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen. So for the past couple of months, Catherine has really gotten into watching scary movies and wants me to watch them with her. But you know, honestly, I don't really like them. I blame in part my older brothers who forced me to watch movies that I was way too young for when I was a kid. And so all of the stuff that was scary in the 80s, I was exposed to far too young. But Catherine watches them and doesn't really seem to be too bothered by them. What I like is not what she likes. She wants the jump scares and the violins swelling as monsters come out from the side. I prefer movies that, if they're going to be scary, are more filled with sort of quiet dread throughout all of it. And, you know, the Book of Wisdom known as Ecclesiastes, of all the books in the Bible, might be the scariest if it comes to quiet dread throughout all of it. It is wisdom that reads like cynical fatalism. And it's a part of a, of a format of scripture known as a counter-narrative or a counter-testimony. It's meant to challenge our normal views of how we see God and the world around us. And I find that in scary times like the ones we're living in now, it's a valuable perspective. And so I hope that you're able to go with us over the next four or five weeks as we explore through the themes of Ecclesiastes I hope that even though that, yeah, some of it's kind of scary and cynical and a little jaded as we read through it, I hope you also find hope for how we might live in our own times of cynicism. The words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Absurdity of absurdities, says the teacher. Absurdity of absurdities, all is absurd. What do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hurries to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Round and round goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they continue to flow. All things are wearisome, more than one can express. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, or the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said? See, this is new. It's already been. 
in the ages before us. The people of long ago are not remembered, nor will there be any remembrance of people yet to come by those who come after them. So this prologue really functions as a summary of the entire book, and the opening line functions as the thesis. Everything is absurd. That little word in Hebrew is kind of hard to translate, so some of your Bibles might say vanity or meaningless, empty or useless. I kind of like the translation that calls it absurd because it kind of works in a year like this. Because we want to make the world make sense, to have some idea of certainty, to predict what Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's Eve might look like, but we're finding out that no, that's not how it works. And any feeling of control or rationality that we had back in, let's say, February, well, that was all an illusion. And so the writer of Ecclesiastes is going to teach us a lesson, that life as we know it, complete waste of time. All of your experience, all of your wisdom, all of your knowledge, it's an affront to reason because it makes no sense. The world around us never will make sense. And the question is, well, what makes life so pointless? As we look around, is there any way to cobble together some sense of meaning in the virtues of knowledge and wisdom and joy? And again, the writer of Ecclesiastes is going to answer us and say, no, that everything is absurd and useless. And there's a common factor, a common reason that binds all of this absurdity together, and that is death. We often think that life is what defines our reality. But Ecclesiastes will tell us, no, death does. I mean, all the work that we do is going to go away like that. I imagine when the kids go out on Saturday to trick or treat, or whatever format that might take, if they come back with nothing but a Halloween bucket full of bitto honey, well, they're going to be disappointed. And that's kind of how life functions for the writer of Ecclesiastes, is that all of our pursuit all of our effort, all of our toil, when we really examine what we have, it's no good. And even that is going to be lost. Death is going to claim whatever we've accumulated in this life. I know what you're saying. Well, maybe the memory of a life well lived, that, that I could pass on a legacy to my children and children's children, that I could be remembered fondly for the good that I do. Again, the teacher will reply, Generations come and go without a whole lot to mention about them. Maybe your pursuit of knowledge and expanding the awareness of the world around us is something worth pursuing. Well, there's never an end to it. The ear never gets full of hearing. The eyes never get filled with seeing. There's always something else to learn, and by the end of it, most of what you've learned will be forgotten. Just look at creation is the point he'll make, not only at the beginning of this book, but also at the very end. The sky runs across, or the sun runs across the sky only to start right back where it began the very next day. The seas constantly receive water but never seem to be full. The biography of this planet is that you're born, you live, and you die. And that's true for literally everything. Oh, and for humans, we have a special gift, or maybe the teacher would say a burden. That while you're living, that big spot in the middle, well, you're going to think about the dying part a lot. You're going to grieve people that you love. You're going to fear for your kid's safety. You're going to avoid going to the doctor if you're afraid they're going to tell you that you might have something that one day is going to kill you. Scary movies even remind you that any minute something terrible could be lurking around the corner, hidden from sight. But we all know it's there. So maybe you're thinking, well, I do have a legacy, and maybe I will be remembered for the good that I do. Let me ask you a question, though. Can you tell me the name of your great-great-grandmother? I bet you probably can't. One of the things the Bible promises is that the blessing of God is found in a good name spread across the generations. The righteous will be remembered. But the teacher says, no, probably not. I mean, we don't even know the name of the guy that wrote this book. We just know him as teacher. So you probably are asking yourself by this point, what's the purpose of keeping on to read this book? Why should we even invest a month or more in looking at what this book would have to say after this depressing beginning? And I think that the weight of the teaching pairs very well with the weight of 
our own troubles. I found that in moments of my past when I've been brought low by the experiences of life, reading through Ecclesiastes makes me feel better. It, in a way, by looking at creation, the writer of this book will be setting up what Jesus will teach as he's on the Sermon of, on the Mount, teaching us to consider the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, how they don't worry, but that God provides for them. And so that if we would just pursue God's righteousness and God's kingdom, that we'll find that all of our other needs are met, that worrying about them doesn't really seem to accomplish very much. Jesus' teaching is not identical to the teacher's instruction, but the idea that creation and the reality of death and the provision of God gives us some perspective. If nothing can be gained from all of our work and all of our worry, then maybe we should just enjoy what we have. Because what we have now is the one thing that is not guaranteed, that is not a constant in this world, and that's life. The book of Ecclesiastes is not trying to minimize our problems in light of faith by reminding us that God is so much bigger than all of our concerns and worries. Instead, what I see Ecclesiastes doing is universalizing our problem, of saying that our problem is your problem, is everyone's problem, is in fact all of creation's problem, that death robs us of any sense of meaning, purpose, identity, fruit that we can point to. And if that's the reality, well, now what? What the teacher will instruct us is that we don't fight against this entropic decay. Instead, by acknowledging that everything has an end, we might discover some wisdom along the way. I mean, think about this year. Uh, so much of the reporting says how unprecedented all this stuff is, and yet a simple look throughout history tells us we've gone through plagues and climate change, and fascist regimes before. This year's not so unprecedented as far as Ecclesiastes is concerned. There's nothing really that new under the sun. And so maybe instead of worrying so much about it, we try to find something redeemable. Why should we have hope now? When we look around, there's plenty to distract us. But the writer's going to say, that's always been there. We can see it as the sun rises and sets, only to rise again as the waters flow to the sea and keep flowing, and as good and bad come with our existence. But you see, by the time we get to the end of this book, there's a darker note that's struck. Why have hope now? It's not because the future will be brighter if we keep pursuing faith and hope and love. Instead, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, we pursue hope now because this might be as bright as it gets. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return with the rain. In the day when the guards of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the women who grind cease working because they are few and those who look through the windows see dimly. When the doors on the street are shut and the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. When one is afraid of heights and terrors are in the road, the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails because all must go to their eternal home and the mourners will go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped and the golden bowl is broken, and the pitcher is broken at the fountain, and the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the breath returns to God who gave it. Absurdity of absurdities, says the teacher. All is absurdity. The point of all of this? Well, we should remember our Creator while the evidence of goodness can be enjoyed, while we can actually look around and say, this time might be good. One day, they say, it won't be so easy. You know, I look back on Facebook at pictures of the kids when they were little, and I miss it. And I remember when I could carry both of them in, in each arm, and the stress of that, plus groceries and, and strollers and changing diapers, and trying to get work done when they're climbing all over the place while Yo Gabba Gabba's playing in the background. And in that moment, I just couldn't wait until they could get a little bit older. They could take care of themselves. The reality is, though, as I look back on those old pictures, I miss it. 
and all the stress that I face today and I'm wondering well, what might tomorrow bring, well, I know that I'm gonna miss this too. Yeah, even this year. So maybe that's a question we should all consider. What of today might we miss tomorrow? And how can we begin to appreciate today as a gift from our Creator? Maybe not perfect, maybe not as wonderful as we would hope, maybe even filled with plenty of reason to grieve and to hurt, to lament and to cry out, but plenty of reason to also celebrate, plenty of reason to say that at least while I'm young, at least while I'm alive, I'll worship, I'll hope, I'll express love and kindness to as many people as I can. Because today is a gift from God. The reality is, is I don't think we have much choice than to do just that. One thing that we know from Ecclesiastes is that tomorrow is far too scary. And so we might as well enjoy today. Amen.
that can feel so absurd, foolish, without really making sense. One thing I know, that God's Spirit is with us, that grace and love and hope can be here, even though everything else seems to be confusing and frustrating. And so I hope that you would find that God's Spirit rests in you, and that in the midst of all of our frustration, we also find hope. May God give you eyes to see and ears to hear all the hope and joy that can be around us. Amen.